Hello Internet. Last time the measurements we did on this camera showed us that the CDS photoresistors have given up the ghost and we will unfortunately have to replace them. We will work on that today. But before we start, a few words of caution. You should only work on the CDS cells if you are definitely sure that they will need to be replaced because they are comparatively fragile components and it is very hard to impossible to find one-to-one -one replacements for these elements today. The electronics in the Pentax Electrospotmatic rely on very specific characteristics of the CDS photoresistors. So you cannot simply drop in any CDS cell and expect the circuit to work. I will show you in these videos how to replace the CDS cells with photoresistors that are still available today and then match the rest of the circuit to the characteristics of these photoresistors. In any case, before you start work on the photoresistors of your camera, you might want to watch the rest of these videos where I show how to test all the other parts of the circuit so you can be really sure that the photoresistors are the problem in your camera. I've already opened the top of the camera again. In order to get access to the photoresistor assembly, we will need to remove the prism cover. It is held by a metal clamp and two springs, so the first task will be to remove these springs and the clamp. And you should carefully remember where the strings are hooked because it can be a bit difficult to reattach them. The prism cover has been removed and we now see the photoresistor assembly that is mounted to the camera body with two screws and we see the small circuit board that connects the two photoresistors in parallel and connections to the camera electronics are made by the blue and red wires. The blue wire going to pin 9 and the red wire going to pin 7, that is the VREC voltage supply. It really just needs a tiny touch with the iron to get these cables off. There is actually a third wire connected to this assembly because it also integrates the contact going to the hot shoe. This is connected to the white wire. You can see that the viewfinder lens actually came out with this assembly and it's just wedged in here, so we will take care not to lose it. And just to be on the safe side, we will remember that the concave side of the viewfinder lens points to the outside of the camera. I will now unsolder the CDS elements and remove them from the assembly.
the CDS cells are glued into the assembly with some unidentifiable substance. I will now try to use a tiny drop of lacquer thinner to soften this blue or lacquer or whatever this is. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you what is the safest way to get the elements out of there. I eventually got out the elements by pushing them with a cut-off Q-tip that is rather soft. The viewfinder lens also dropped out. It would have been smarter to take it out right away to avoid that. I am now measuring the outer diameter of the CDS element without the flange and it is slightly below 5.5 millimeters. Let's try the other one. Yeah, also slightly below 5.5 millimeters. Unfortunately, I didn't find replacements that have exactly the same dimensions. The ones I'm going to try are somewhat smaller. They have a diameter without the flange of 4.62 millimeters. And I could install two of these in the camera I already repaired by increasing the diameter slightly by wrapping some isolating tape around it. Our next task will be to find suitable replacements for these elements by characterizing some of these modern CDS cells. In particular, we need to find two cells that are rather well matched so that the left and the right photoresistor contribute equally and the field of view is equally weighted for brightness in the left and the right regions. As an additional reference when calibrating these photoresistors, we will use a modern photodiode as a reference. For characterization, I wired up the original CDS cells, the new CDS cells I had available and a photodiode for reference. You may notice that I heated the heat shrink only at the part farthest from the sensor cells because the CDS cells probably don't like heat or any other influence for that matter. I installed all the cells in a little test chick to hold them all at the same consistent angle towards the light. Then I mounted the test chick facing the white cardboard area of my light controller setup. Before we discuss the results, let's take a look at some general considerations regarding repair of this camera. In the end, we need something in the camera that converts the light reaching the viewfinder housing into a voltage at pin 9 that has the following form. If we measure the light as exposure value for ISO 100, the voltage must be the exposure value in stops times a constant slope plus some constant DC offset. The slope must be matched to the properties of the discharge network and when we are using the stock discharge network the slope should be about 135 millivolts per stop. In the upcoming episodes we will see how this value comes to be and how we can change it if necessary. The offset can be compensated by calibrating the resistive dividers in the camera within some limits of course. An important question is how much light are we actually talking about? By comparing in-camera and out-of-camera characterizations of sensors I reach the following conclusions. When the camera is seeing an exposure value of L 
that is constant over all its field of view, the light incident at the sensors corresponds to an exposure value of L minus 9.1 stops. This is with a 50 mm lens with an wide open aperture of f over 1.8. In the table on the right hand side you see what this means for the full range over which the Pentax Electrospotmatic is specified from EV1 to EV18 of reflected light at ISO 100. The table lists the luminance at the sensors in lux and in foot candles. These values will be useful when we check data sheets of light sensors. And you see that the illuminance varies over a range of about 0.01 to 1000 lux. There are two obvious possibilities. The first one is to use cadmium sulfide cells as originally done in the camera. And the second one would be to use silicon photodiodes. Both of these sensor types are available in compatible sizes and with a spectral sensitivity centered on the visual spectrum peaking at 550 nanometers. CDS cells have the advantage of being authentic for this type of camera and they also need no amplification circuits. However, they are quite nonlinear in their response and they have a variable output impedance a problem we will discuss later. They are also quite fragile and in particular they fail when some moisture gets into the hermetic enclosure. CDS cells also are a mostly obsolete technology, so there are only few and quite unreliable sources available for them. They are mostly avoided in modern devices, also because the cadmium used in them is toxic. On the other hand, silicon photodiodes have a very nice linear response to the light. They are more rugged than the CDS cells and silicon photodiodes are an active contemporary technology. So there are lots of sources available and they are also compatible with modern guidelines of avoiding toxic materials. However, silicon photodiodes are not period accurate for a camera like the Pentax Electrospotmatic and they also would require us to add an amplifier circuit to the camera electronics. Because I wanted to keep the repair of this camera as historically authentic as possible, I decided to go with the CDS cells. There may come a time when the availability of CDS cells becomes so bad that we will have to substitute them by silicon photodiodes when repairing historical cameras. And it's good to know that this option will be available. We will still use a photodiode as a reference in our measurements because it lets us read relative light levels much more accurately than what I could get from my handheld exposure meters. For your reference, here's the measurement setup. The diode is run at zero volts bias using a trans impedance amplifier so that the current through the diode is quite accurately proportional to the illuminance. Let's check out the results. First in table form. I read the photo current of the silicon diode before and after each of the measurement series at each light level to check how stable the illuminance is. And it looks very good only in the lower light levels. We start to see some noise, which is most probably due to the measurement amplifier being not properly shielded. At each light level, I measured the resistances of the eight new CDS photocells and also of the two original cells, right and left, being measured separately here. This first table is with the sensors being directly exposed to the light from the light controller. The second table was measured with the sensors being covered by a black cardboard shroud in order to reach even lower light levels. When plotted as a function of the reflected light I measured with my Pentax digital spot meter, the results look a bit wiggly, but that's just because the measurement with the handheld exposure meter is not that accurate. 
And that's exactly why we need the photo diode as a better reference. The response of the diode is very nicely linear. Within a measurement error of let's say 1%, the photo current is perfectly proportional to the illuminance. We can also quantify the error I made in reading the reflected light and it is below a tenth of a stop on average. From now on all plots and calculations will actually use the photo current as a reference for relative light levels. Once we use the photodiode we get smooth curves when we plot the CDS resistances as functions of the illuminance at the sensor. In this plot the vertical red lines mark the spec range of the Pentax Electrospotmatic from EV1 to EV18. The curves show some slight imperfections in the regions where I joined the measurement series that were taken with and without the cardboard shroud. Let's first look at the results for the CDS cells that were originally in the camera. Here we have the right element and the left element and you see that their response is very different. The left CDS cell is working just fine while the right cell is broken and it has way too little light sensitivity. As the two CDS cells are connected in parallel in the camera, the much lower resistance of the right cell drags down the overall resistance and the behavior of the camera is therefore dominated by the broken right cell. For the new cells we see that there is quite a significant spread between the resistances of individual cells. So some selection and matching is definitely required. The new cells show two high values both in the absolute resistance that goes up into many tens to maybe even hundreds of mega ohms and also in the slope. Here we see a plot of the power law exponent gamma. The working left CDS cell has a gamma value that varies from about 0.5 to about 0.7 and the broken right cell has a much lower gamma value that is about 0.4 for very high light values and then decreases to almost zero in the lower values. Unfortunately the new CDS cells are tested have gamma values that are much too high and they also do not correspond to what the datasheet for these sensors claims. The blue line here is what the datasheet specifies between 1 and 100 lux. They claim that the sensors have a gamma of 0.7 but you see that in fact already in this range the gamma is close to 1 and for lower light values it becomes really really large uh, with gamma moving up to about 1.3. This also shows how important it is to characterize the sensors ourselves. We just cannot rely on the data sheets and especially this company Advanced Photonics has absolutely terrible data sheets that are full of useless and misleading information. This is a good point to talk about the CDS cells that are still available today. I only found two companies in the world that are still producing hermetically sealed CDS cells. The first is Advanced Photonics and it has two models that are potentially interesting to us. They are both slightly smaller than the original cells with 4.6 mm diameter versus 5.5 of the originals. The first model NSL 06S53 was the one we just characterized. There are ways to make this model work in the Pentax Electrospotmatic, but we will try to find cells that are a better fit for the camera. The second company I found is the Chinese company JCHL. It has two interesting models and they both have exactly the diameter we need of 5.5 millimeters. According to their data sheets, gamma should be around 
0.75 dark resistance of 1 mega ohm should be a pretty good match to the original cells. The company making the advanced photonics CDS cells used to be called Silonex during the time they did not yet have their datasheets written by a baboon. So the Silonex datasheets are somewhat more usable than the new ones. The new ones you might find under the names Advanced Photonics or maybe also under the name Luna. Here we see the model that is most interesting to us. For us most interesting are the so-called type 5 CDS cells that have the peak of their spectral sensitivity at 550 nanometers. The most important step for a coarse matching of the CDS characteristic to the circuit is the selection of the diode used for log compression. The main condition for matching is that the voltage difference per current doubling in the diode times the gamma value of the CDS elements should match the slope expected by the discharge network, which stock is about 135 millivolts per stop. The original circuit uses a Sina diode that seems to be about a 4.7 volts Sina diode with a characteristic that is exceptionally close to an ideal exponential IV curve. However, both the diode and the CDS cells will have slight deviations from their ideal exponential and power law behavior respectively. So what can we do to deal with that? Well, the simplest possible option is to add resistors in series and in parallel with the CDS elements and the diode to slightly modify the behavior of the circuit. An example of that is the 100 ohm resistor I called R12 that I found in the original circuit board. It corresponds to this serial resistor that is in series with the log compression diode. The gray points in this plot show a baseline simulation of the voltage at pin 9 depending on the exposure value that was simulated without any of the resistors in the network. Adding serious resistors modifies the behavior of the network mostly in the region of high light values where the resistance of the CDS cells is low. And we can see that adding a serious resistor in series with the diode raises the voltage curve for high light values and adding a serious resistor in series with the CDS cells lowers the curve parallel resistors mostly modifies the curve in the low light region. Adding a parallel resistor in parallel with the CDS cells raises the pin 9 voltage for the low light values and adding a parallel resistance in parallel with the diode lowers pin 9 voltage. Overall, this gives us a few options to deal with non-linearities. However, we do not get much control over the middle region of the curve without distorting the curve at the extremes. Another way to modify the voltage curve is trimming of the VREG voltage supply. We see here a baseline simulated with VREG at 5.5 volts. And if we increase VREG to 6 volts, this causes a slightly steeper voltage curve. If we decrease it to 5 volts, the curve becomes slightly shallower. Trimming the VREG supply voltage allows us to slightly modify the overall slope of the voltage curve without causing too much distortion of the curve in the extreme low and high values. How well could our camera work if both of the CDS cells would behave like the left good one? Here we see the results of a simulation in table and in graphical form 
And if you want to know any details about how to set up such simulations, just contact me. With both cells behaving like the remaining good one, the voltage at pin 9 would be quite close to the desired 135 millivolts per stop slope. We see that is slightly dropping off for the higher values and we get a maximum error of 1.3 stops and an average error of about half a stop compared to the ideal linear behavior. Could we improve this result by increasing the series resistor? Here I repeated the simulation now with a 560 ohm series resistor and indeed the results look quite a bit better with our maximum error now just above a third of a stop and the average error at 0.17 stops. VREG for this simulation was set to 5.5 volts which seems the ideal value for this combination and is also a good choice because it provides long battery life. What about the new NSL06S53 cells? Well, dropping them in as a one-to-one -one replacement certainly doesn't work as the simulation here confirms. The voltage curve would have a much too high slope. Can we fix these problems by tweaking the resistor values? Not really. While we can improve the maximum error, it just doesn't quite work. The slope of the curve varies too much due to the large variation of the gamma exponent of this sensor. However, during my work on the earlier camera that I already repaired and where I only had these sensors available, I found something amazing, namely that if you combine these sensors with a different Sina diode, in my case a 2 volt Sina diode, the Sina diode's deviations from the ideal exponential IV curve counteract the deviations of the CDS elements from their ideal power law behavior. And overall the effects compensate each other so well that we get quite a linear behavior with a somewhat acceptable range of errors. However, we cannot get the slope near 135 millivolts per stop. Instead, the slope is now close to 118 millivolts per stop and I found a way to modify the discharge network that matches the slope and makes the camera work overall. Exciting times, new sensors have arrived, both from the US and from China. So let's take a look what we have got here. From the US I got the NSL5110. Diameter is 4.61 millimeters, as expected. From China, I ordered three different sensors. I've got the GL5510F, 20F, and 30F. Unfortunately, the maybe the most interesting sensor for us, the GL5501F, was out of stock. So. Let's just hope that the 5510F will be a good fit. The other ones I ordered just for completion and because the cost of the parts themselves is almost negligible compared to the shipping cost and the absolutely crazy Austrian import taxes. So this was really expensive to get this stuff here. These ones should all be 5.5 millimeters. So let's check the diameter. Okay, they are below 5.36 millimeters, this one. 5.39. So all of this is without the flange. But they definitely would be a, physically a much better fit to replace the originals than the smaller ones from Advanced Photonics with 4.6 millimeters. I have already prepared my test jig 
to take up more sensors. So let's populate it. This manual characterization of photocells is a very tedious and time-consuming process. As you will see later in the video, I am currently prototyping an automated system that makes this much, much easier and faster. If you are interested in selecting and matching CDS cells yourself, please tell me in the comments, because the effort to fully develop this automated system would only be justified if there are people out there that would also be interested in using it. Finally, I have all the new sensors in my Frightful test jig here and all their positions and color coding is documented. So the next step is to go to the dark room and to characterize these sensors. Here are the results for the new sensors in table form, but let's go right to the plots. The new sensors also do not meet their datasheet specifications. The cyan region would be the specified range for the GL5510F and we see that the actually measured curves, the blue ones, are consistently above the specified resistance ranges. The GL5530 is somewhat similar to the advanced photonics sensors we already characterized earlier and develops a much too high dark resistance. The GL5520 sensors are somewhat below, but they still go up to too high resistances in the low values. With the GL5510, the blue lines, we are getting into a usable range. So they approach about 10 mega ohms at the lower end of the spec range for the Pentax Electrospotmatic. According to their data sheet, they should have a dark resistance of 1 mega ohm, but we see here that they are at least an order of magnitude more resistant. Finally, the advanced photonics 5110 sensors performed similar to the GL5510F with a somewhat larger spread between samples. While none of the sensors meet their datasheet specifications, we can conclude that the advanced photonics 5110 and the GL5510F are the most interesting candidates for our purposes. The measured data can reasonably be fit by second order models, at least for the sensor models that are most interesting to us. We can therefore extract the gamma values and we see that they are all over the place. And for all of these sensors, the gamma values vary quite a lot. I analyzed all possible pairings of sensors to be used as the left and the right CDS cell. And the winner is the combinations of sensors 3 and 12, which are two GL5510F models. We can also confirm that visually by plotting only these two sensors in blue here. And we see that their curves, the solid and the dotted lines, are right on top of each other for most of the range. In this plot they are also compared to the curves for the original left and right CDS cell. In the highlight values the GL5510F perform similarly to the good original CDS cell, but in the low light values they have significantly higher resistance by about one decimal order of magnitude and overall the resistance curves have a significantly steeper slope than the original CDS cells. Also the gamma values of the new sensors vary much more across the range of illuminances than for the original cells. Consequently the GL5510F cells are not good drop-in replacements for the originals. I have simulated here what we would get if we use the new 
CDS cells with the existing original 4.7 volt Sina diode and the original 100 ohm series resistor and we see that we don't get a good match with a maximum error of 3.4 stops at the low end and also quite a lot of deviation in the high values with an average error of 1.5 stops so definitely beyond what would be acceptable. In order to get the slope of the voltage curve down to the desired 135 millivolts we will need to use a different diode for log compression. In part 2 we characterized the original diode and we found that it has 250 millivolts per current doubling. We will need to use a diode that has significantly less than this value. I therefore tried a combination of five standard diodes in series. This should give us about 169 millivolts per current doubling. And indeed we find a much better match in the simulation with the maximum error now at 1.3 stops now in at the high end and a much better average error of 0.56 stops but most importantly we see that now in the middle of the range where we have otherwise little control over the slope we have a very good match to the desired 135 millivolts per stop now we can address the mismatch at the low and high end. And here's the solution I came up with. I changed the series resistor to 51 ohm and I added a parallel resistance of 6 mega ohm in parallel with the CDS cells. I was really blown away when I saw the simulation results for this combination for the first time. The simulation looks almost too good to be true with a maximum error of about a sixth of a stop at EV3 and an average error below a tenth of a stop. Can this be true? Can we really reach such a good performance with only these very simple modifications? To try it out I built a prototype combining the two CDS cells and the log compression framework. You can see here that string of five tiny SMD diodes, the series 51 ohm resistor and the two 3 mega ohm resistors making up the parallel 6 mega ohm resistor. This time I also used the beginnings of an automated system controlled by an Arduino Micro for automated data capture. And I'm quite excited how well the system worked. It makes characterizing the CDS cells so much easier and faster. Well, the results are absolutely fantastic. Here we see the pin 9 voltage delivered by the prototype and it's almost a perfectly straight line. Moreover, when we compare it to the simulated values that are shown here as cyan dots, the actual values and the simulation are very, very close to each other. The measured data was captured in three series. The blue dots are measured with the sensors pointed directly towards the white cardboard in the light controller. The yellow series was captured with the sensors pointing straight up to decrease the illuminance that they see. And the green series was captured with a cardboard shroud over the sensors to even further lower the illuminance seen by the sensors. The reference photodiode was always mounted in the same way facing the light controller to give us reliable measurements. In the very low values the green series that was captured with the photoresistors covered by the cardboard shroud we see some deviations that might be measurement errors. Here I plotted the error relative to a perfectly linearly rising voltage and over the full spec range from EV1 to EV18 
the error stays within a band of plus and minus a third of a stop. Actually, it's mostly within a sixth of a stop. These points here, the, the outliers that come from the green series are actually measurement errors, but even if we include them, the average error over the whole specified range is at 0 0.08 stops, even lower than the 0 0.09 predicted by the simulation. And if these outliers are really measurement errors, as I believe, we see that the simulation also correctly predicted that the worst case error appears around EV3 with about one sixth of a stop deviation from the perfect linear dependence. These results are extremely encouraging and much better than anything I hoped for. It looks like the camera will work perfectly with the new GL5510F sensors and with the modified log compression framework. To summarize, with the GL5510F from JCHL, we found a very promising candidate for replacing the CDS cells in the Pentax Electrospotmatic and it also has the correct size. Well, actually it's uh, 5.4 millimeters, but close enough. If this one is not available, we could also use the Advanced Photonics NSL 5110. The GL5501F might also be very interesting, but I couldn't get hold of any samples for this one. I do not recommend any other of the CDS cells I have tested, like the 06S53. It is possible to make the camera work with these at least approximately, but it's quite complicated and I really don't recommend it. We still need to mount the new sensors in the camera and find a place for the new log compression framework. But before we do that, we should check that the rest of the camera works and that the discharge network actually fits the expected slope of 135 millivolts per stop. These are the things we will check in the next part, so see you then. This video is dedicated to my father, who is a lifelong Pentax enthusiast. He owns the cameras and he has also provided for the quite significant costs of this project. So thank you, Dad.